Hello. It's good to see you again. This time we're talking about acting, and this is a general introduction to talking about acting. Acting is something that we all see. We've seen by this point most of us hundreds, if not thousands, perhaps millions of actors at different times in our lives on television, on film, on stage. And it's something that we can see. I think that when we see it, we go, oh, that's acting. But when you try to define it as what it precisely is and how to think about it, is you'll find that there have been many people over the course of human history who have had different ideas about what acting is, what good acting is, what even it is that an actor does, or what an actor is like, or whether or not we should even uh, accept actors into our society or our culture. We know that it has some importance to people who have seen actors, and it certainly rouses comment from people. At some times, actors have been part of uh, uh, representatives, and riots have occurred because of actors in history and because of what actors have done. So it's a huge concept, but when you get closer to it, it is a little bit harder to describe. So let me introduce it this way. If you take a cooking class, at the end of the class one assumes that you're cooking better. If you take a class in accounting, one assumes that you know more about accounting and the things of accounting more. At the end of an acting class, what do you do better? And that's an interesting question to ask. Is we teach acting, uh, me and several of my colleagues around the world all teach acting. What is it precisely that we're teaching? What do we assume the students will be better at at the end of their time with us? And that is an interesting question. In history, there are some colleagues of mine who find it very interesting to look at the history of acting and look at the origins of acting in ancient Athens and even going back to uh, paratheatrical activity in ancient Egypt. And there is this historic association between acting and people being in masks, so that acting is a performance with some sort of mask on. The other kind of people that we see doing this in history, prehistory, and in um, different cultures and different stages of, of where they are. Uh, we see people in masks, but the people that we tend to see in masks are medicine men, shamans, uh, people who claim to have some sort of special relationship in speaking to the gods or in executing some sort of special magic. When Thespis first stepped out of the chorus in ancient Greece, and started replying to the chorus in some way. We don't have a real sense of what he did or how he did it. But at some point, he made a major change. And that is, in the Iliad, Homer, or whoever is uh, reciting the Iliad at any given time, is telling the story of Achilles, is telling the story of Agamemnon. And so it's like when your parents told you the story of Little Red Riding Hood, is that your parent didn't become Little Red Riding Hood. They might do voices as they tell it, but they're telling the story of those characters. Theater and acting did something fundamentally different, and we're still working to figure out exactly the phenomenology of it. And the difference is, is instead of telling the story of Achilles, is that you take on something and you have the, uh, in Yiddish, chutzpah, you have the spine, you have the courage to stand up and say, I am Achilles. Well, I am not Achilles, I'm Nathan. I'm not someone who is a Greek hero. And so what does that mean to all of a sudden say, I am no longer myself, I am someone else. I'm claiming to be someone else. I think that is the fundamental question or the fundamental issue that encompasses 
acting? What does it mean to claim to be someone else? Now, different people over the ages have taken different approaches to this. We know that to, uh, we have quite a bit of evidence for this. We know that in ancient Athens, that the actors, when they proclaimed to be whatever character they were, whether it's Agamemnon or Clytemnestra in the Oresteia, that they were masked and they wore special clothing and wore probably special shoes. And so consequently, they were taken out of the normal, everyday kind of experience to portray themselves as this character. Uh, and there was a certain aesthetic that went with it, is that the first audiences of the Oresteia, or Oedipus, were accustomed to seeing tragedy in this way, and because those uh, the theatrons seated thousands of people, it was something that was shared by the whole community as part of the a spring festival of uh, the city of Great Dionysia. And so it was just a matter of course that that's how it's done, and of course that's how you would do it. As time adjusted and things changed over centuries and centuries, and the masks went away, and um, we're looking at the human face, now all of a sudden you have someone with a face saying the equivalent of, I am Achilles, or I am Agamemnon, or I am Phaedra, or I am whoever. And what does that mean for someone without a mask, you know, some sort of physical face covering, to say that? And then when we get into the medieval period, of course, you have actors getting up on the uh, stages in mystery plays and claiming to be Jesus and claiming to be God. And we know that, you know, we know that Harry is a wheelwright, and he's not Jesus. We know that very well. We know that, uh, you know, we know that Edward is a really very good, uh, is a very good miller. He's not God. So we know that, but yet we watch it and we enjoy it. And, and curiously, even though we know that uh, those two up there, uh, Joseph and John, and Joseph is in drag playing Noah's wife in one of these plays. We know that <laughs> we know that Joseph's not a woman, and yet because he's in uh, the dress and has probably some padding on and is you know whacking on uh, on Noah for uh, you know whatever shrewish reasons that she has in, the, in that comedy, is that we still basically believe and are able to go well yeah that's Noah's wife even though we know it's not Noah's wife. Same as we get into the Elizabethan period, and even to today. We know that Daniel Day-Lewis is not Abraham Lincoln, and we know that Mark Hamill, as wonderful as he is, is not Luke Skywalker. There is no Luke Skywalker. He's a character in a story, and yet we also know that there is some inseparable tie between Mark Hamill and our notion of Luke Skywalker. And when we see something happen to Luke Skywalker, when, an, uh, when a lightsaber comes through and chops off part of his arm, we, I remember being in the theater when that happened. People gasp, people uh, get concerned. And certainly when you've seen horror movies or when you see um, you know, uh, violent movies and violence happens to the character because it's happening to a character we we, we if it's done well we have fellow feeling for it and and this notion of some sort of relationship between the fiction of a character in a story and the reality of the human person who is portraying that character is very deep now what does the actor feel as all of this is going on there's been a great argument about this over the centuries. There have been some actors who have said the important thing is for the audience to have feelings. It's important for the audience to be gripped by what's going on. Me, I'm going out for a cigarette. I'm going out for a drink after the scene. I don't know what you're concerned about. And so they have what is called an inner coolness or an inner coldness to that which is going on and communicating the passions or the feelings or the emotions of the scene to the audience 
and it's not something that they feel they have to involve themselves in a very great way. And there are some uh, very important uh, actors and uh, theorists in uh, history who have made that point. On the other hand, there are other actors, very great, important actors, and other uh, theorists who said, no, you've got to have some sort of fellow feeling as the actor for what the character's going through to communicate that appropriately to an audience. And if you're an acting student, how do you deal with that? And as an actor, how do you deal with that? It's an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing tug of war in some cases, I think, in talking to colleagues and friends who are actors, and in my own experience as an actor, I know that there are times when uh, you feel things quite deeply, and other times where you go, uh, I've, I've got to back off of this. If I involve myself too closely or too clearly in this action, or the, these tasks that I'm doing, that would not be good. Uh, a good example of this is stage violence. Uh, when you're having a stage fight with someone, uh, you do have to have a certain measure of uh, excitement and desire, uh, because if you're in a fight, you're wanting to hurt the other person, and particularly, you know, I've been uh, more than one time, you know, a soldier and, and have killed people on stage with my sword, which was made of plastic or wood or, you know, some sort of thing. Rarely uh, have I been at a place where uh, I actually had a metal sword. And so uh, you have to behave in some way as if uh, you want to do it, but then you also have to remain a certain, have a certain coolness inside you to go, yes, I'm moving my sword here, I'm moving my sword here, and this is what we're doing, I'm moving here, I'm moving my sword here, so that your partner doesn't put out one of your eyes and you don't put out one of your partner's eyes. And, you know, safety is very important there. Likewise, if you're doing stage affection, and this is something that, that people always get very interested in, is how does stage affection work? You know, how do you kiss someone on stage, uh, or more, depending on the play, but certainly uh, kissing is a normal human activity. I think it's been done for a long, 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 long time. And how do you do it with uh, the feelings that usually come with a kiss? Because kissing for us, and I think for, more, for most humans, is a very intimate act. We don't just kiss everyone and I think with good reason. So you're on stage and you have this moment where uh, you might have uh, any two people, and it doesn't matter, uh, man, woman, man, man, woman, woman, uh, you're having a relationship on stage and you kiss and then you go home to your own particular loved one. You're not going away with this person because that's acting, right? Well, what is that? But one of the things that a lot of uh, theorists and, and people pin on uh, acting is that it's truthful behavior. And that is what the actor is aiming for, is how to behave truthfully in the circumstances of whatever the story is that they're telling. And that might differ greatly whether we're talking about a Greek tragedy, or playing Hamlet, or if we're on uh, an episode of Saved by the Bell, or uh, uh, a Grey's Anatomy, or uh, an, an SCIS show, is whatever the circumstances that that particular character is going through, is do we behave in a way that seems truthful and seems to engage the audience? And uh, one of my heroes in acting is an actor named Sir Derek Jacobi. He's an English actor who I've admired for many decades. 
And uh, he's been giving uh, a lot of, not a lot of, he's given, been given interviews uh, lately, which I luckily have been able to see on the internet. And one of the things that he says uh, on, in interviews and also in his uh, memoirs is that acting is a little bit of a trick. And the trick is, is convincing an audience, convincing a group of humans, that what you're doing is, is, is truthful, is believable, under the circumstances of whatever you're doing. And he has done a wide variety of, of different work. He's played uh, on TV, you know, he's played uh, an older gentleman who has recombined uh, with a high school sweetheart. They hadn't seen each other for many years. Both of them had gotten married. Both of their spouses had passed away. And then on social media, they reconnected. And he plays this very realist, what we would call a realistic part on television. And he does that, but he's also played Cyrano de Bergerac. He's played Hamlet, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times in hundreds of performances. And so it, there's a wide variety of things that he's done. But in all of the work that he does, regardless of what it is, is that he has the trick of convincing the audience to believe that his behavior is truthful within the context of the story that's being told. And in the end, I think that that's what the actor's job is. Now, how the actor can accomplish that is wide and varied because, as I said, you can maybe have deep feelings inside about the character and what the character is going through or you might have what they say is an inner coolness or coldness about it. Uh, and actors from both schools have been very convincing to audiences and have been acclaimed. One of the things that's very interesting to me in looking at the history of acting is the use of the word realism and realistic. Is that if you look at the history of great Shakespearean acting in England over the course of the last well, since Shakespeare's time, actually, because when Richard Burbage uh, passed away, and what evidence we have about Richard Burbage, who played the first Hamlet and the first Romeo and the first Lear and the first Othello and the first Scottish guy, is that he, uh, when he played Richard III, had the habit of having a dagger at his side, and he would lift it up out of its sheath and let it drop up and drop, up and drop, up and drop. And there's some historical evidence that the historic Richard III, the actual king, Richard III, actually did that in real life. And people commented that Richard Burbage did that. Now we would think that that's, uh, and probably people in Shakespeare's time knew that. And so that's a comment on that he is being real. And as we go down through the ages and actors like Thomas Betterton and David Garrick and the Kembles, to Edmund Keane, to the great actor Henry Irving, John Gilgood in his younger years through Actors Today, is that one of the things that when you read criticism or reviews of their performances, one of the things that is constantly coming up is how real their performances are. And when you look at pictures and of course drawings, etchings, and paintings, for the more historic ones, because photo photography uh, didn't exist yet, is that you look at those and you think, oh my gosh, this looks posed. This doesn't look real at all from our point of view. And that's always the question. And then when you hear some historic recordings of Shakespeare from the early 20th century, and you hear someone being very grand, with their voice and their being beautiful and how they speak. Uh, it's, that is a stylistic thing, which, again, like the ancient Greeks watching Sophocles in a mask and special clothes and special shoes coming out as Oedipus, and they believed it. They just thought that was just how it was you did it, is that the audience in the early 20th century evidently had a certain amount of expectation for hearing that sound. And that is something that is always going to be a part of acting, is that it's 
uh, and this is the probably the final part that I would bring up, is that it has to do with that communication between the actor and the audience, which is very completely essential in the theater, is that you have this symbiotic link between you as the live actor and the live audience, that you're human beings all in this together, vested in this story, vested in these characters, interested to see what's going on, and interested and emotionally, uh, emotionally involved in what the characters are doing. And when you have that situation going on, that's when you have the magic. That's when you think, oh yes, this is a good actor. I've seen good acting, is when that happens. And we don't always know all of the elements that it takes to get there. There seems to be variables for every human, of course, which is only natural. But we know that it's important. And we know that when we see an actor who really shows us the truth of this situation, doesn't matter if it's a comedy or a drama, and it strikes something inside our hearts or strikes something on our funny bone and makes us laugh uproariously, is when those things occur is that we then know we're not alone. We're not people isolated on an island, but we're part of a larger humanity, and other people have felt what we felt and they have expressed it in a way that allows us to realize we're not alone. And that's the genuine gift of fine acting, is when you see it and you feel emotionally involved and feel emotionally uplifted. Again, if it's comedy, drama, tragedy, it makes no difference. But at the end of knowing that you've been through this, human experience. It's very human. And you've come out the other side. So that's acting in the end, I think. So we've said a number of different things. There are two or three points that I would again draw your attention to. One, there has been disagreement in many points of view about acting and actors. Some people associate acting with almost a quasi-religious experience because of the history because of the masks and the relationship to uh, the other humans that do it, shamans and magic men and, and medical men, and that sort of thing. Uh, so there's that group of people who think that there's that level of specialness to it. The other, th uh, the other point I would draw your attention to is that the actor, unlike telling stories about someone or of some character, assumes the character in some way within the story. Third, as, as while assuming the character, the actor is working to provide some kind of behavior, show some kind of behavior that makes sense within the structure of whatever the story is and how it's being told. And they may be cold inside or not, and finally, the actor communicates with an audience, communicates in a way that allows the audience in to understand what is going on and what they're doing. Those are the points that I would like you to uh, remember from our chat here today. Uh, when we meet again, we're going to talk uh, not so much about the history of acting, but we're going to uh, center and probably center a couple of different talks on the work of one of the greatest, uh, most innovative teachers of acting in history, a man uh, who comes from Russia named Konstantin Stanislavsky. He's shown up before a couple of times in our talks, and now it's time to put our huge focus on, on Mr. Stanislavsky and see what he's really about. I look forward to seeing you in our next chat. So long.